action. Welcome to Filmmakers Focus. I'm Doc Kennedy. Today's focus is the actor's journey. I had the opportunity to speak with Patrick Gorman. Patrick is a career actor. You've seen him in such pictures as Gettysburg, Gods and Generals, and most recently in the hit TV show, Sleepy Hollow. Patrick shares with us some of the ups and downs of his career, what he wishes that he would have done differently. We talk about networking, mentorship, and the value of those in making your career the best it can be. So we'll get to that in just a moment. First, I want to invite you to hit us up on Instagram and Twitter at Filmmakers Focus. Join the Facebook group and just get involved in the conversation. We're all on the same type of trip here, whether we're producing, directing, uh, doing the whole shebang, or acting. And let us know what else you want to be learning through this podcast. We're about halfway through season one, and it's off to a great start. So we want to make sure that heading into season two, we're covering the topics that you want to learn about. So without further delay, here is my conversation with Patrick Gorman on The Actor's Journey. Cut. Welcome to the show, Patrick. Thank you, Doc. It's, it's great to be here. I much appreciate it. I, I am super excited about this. Let's backtrack to how you got started in acting. All right. So there I was, standing on stage, the spotlight in my eyes, I can't see the audience, but I feel them. They're, they're waiting for me to do something. I'm, I'm hooked for life. And what age is this? I'm four years old, wow. and I'm already a character man. I'm playing a 70-year-old character, Geppetto, in a children's production of Pinocchio. It was a full 350-seat stage theater, orchestra, a cast, full cast, singing, dancing, dialogue. And uh, so I, I've never wanted to do anything else, although in my life I've certainly done a lot of other things. So maybe you can say uh, I'm already living my dream. Yeah. Well, yes and no, but that's how I started. So did your parents set you up with that? Well, my mother was a dancer, okay. and she had a dance school at that time. And that's, you know, I, I was born into that, if you want. But we lived in a small town, although uh, every year we went to, my, my mother met my father in, in Hollywood when she was trying to get into films, and uh, that's how they hooked up. Later they went back to my hometown, which is a small town in California on the way to Sequoia National Park. It's called Visalia. So I grew up in a really small town. Well, my mother was taught dancing That's because she was a wonderful dancer. And that's the way I started out. But that's literally how I was hooked. I mean, I knew I wanted to, I, I didn't know really what acting, but, I, you know, I saw films. And at the age of four, I'd, listen, I had my first audition, my first audition before this, actually, when I was three years old and we were still in Hollywood, I auditioned for our gang comedies at oh, the age wow. of three. <laughs> and I, uh, I, I hate to even tell you what year that was. <laughs> but that was uh, before the Second World War, that's for sure. <laughs> so that would have been with the original cast of our gang Yes, comedy. yes. Uh, but the thing is, you know, this thing about, you know, you have dream warriors. And I, one of... One of the things that seems important to me that I tell people who want to get into business and that kind of thing, once you decide on your dream, you have to really make specific goals that will help you attain that dream. And my idea has always been do it, then you study. In other words, when I started out at the age of four, well, of course, I, I had to learn how to tap dance because there was tap dancing in it, and that's how it started. But actually, I performed, and then I studied, rather than I, I studied, and then I performed. And uh, that seems um, simplistic, but here's the reason I, I say that for, it's very important. One of the first 
bits of advice I got oh, much later in my life was from the movie star at the time, was James Cagney. Mm -hmm. And he was speaking to a bunch of young actors, and he said, if there's anything in your life that you could imagine enjoying doing, do that. Don't become an actor. Mm -hmm. If you want to become an actor, it's got to be everything for you because there's, it's, it's too difficult. There's constant rejection. And there's only a small percent of the people make it, you know, movie stars, high-profile actors. So you, it's something that you really have to care about the most. The next thing is then you've got to get out and do things. And, of course, it's taken me a long time to learn. I didn't do this at the age of four, of course. Uh, uh, spe specify the goals and decide upon a strategy and keep statistics and build relationships and all that stuff that is so important to a career. It took me a long time to understand that. But that's one of the things I, I, I like to tell. I do coach some young actors, uh, and I'm coaching right now a few returning vets who are actually some who have been actors before trying to get back into it. Okay. That's, it's really important that you're clear about your dream. And I, dream and goal are the same kind of thing. I mean, they're similar. You need to be very specific about what you want, and then you've got to learn everything you can about it. And that's a lot of people uh, I've been asked when I've been doing a reenactment years ago when I used to be in fact invited to reenactments and that kind of thing. Some people would ask, well, how do you get started? And I would say, well, you have to start where you are. Uh, you don't have to go to Hollywood or New York. I mean, you, whatever town you're in, even a small town, you should make the most of all the opportunities that are there. Yeah. And then when you're more ready or when you think you're ready, then you go for the, you know, Hollywood or New York City or wherever the center that you're choosing. But it's really important that you make that decision because if you're in, indecisive, it's going to hold you back, of course. I, I, I appreciate that. You have to sell yourself to it. Or you're not going to get anywhere. You know, a lot of people come here, and the, the, the myth is that if I'm a brilliant actor and I study with the right people, then I'll have a brilliant career. Uh, and that's not, it's a maybe, uh, not, not necessarily. Because it's so much, it's about building relationships. And I don't mean phony flattery. I mean authentic acknowledgement of people that you want to work with and that you have worked with and that kind of thing. And you, it's just like any business. You have to develop relationships. You have to market. You have to have skill at what you're doing, of course. But you need to treat um, the film business, acting. We're talking about acting here mm -hmm. since I'm an actor. Uh, and you've got to treat it like a business. I didn't really do that for most of my career. I kind of understood it, but I didn't do it in that way. And it's only been in the last few years where I've started to really understand that and apply it. And had I done that when I was earlier, I, who knows, I might be a star by now. <laughs> I've certainly had a better career. Well, I appreciate that you bring up authentic relationships because I think it's easy to just take networking and try to build little pieces that will further us and not really care about the person on your side. And it's about so much more than that. It's about really oh, it, caring it, it's, about people. It's absolutely crucial. When you think about it, you wouldn't have any friends if you didn't authentically acknowledge them in some way. Yeah. And, of course, if you meet someone famous or some, you want to, say you want to work with uh, Robert Duvall or whoever it is, some yeah. famous director, Ron Maxwell for a film or, or Scorsese or anyone, you, in your contact with them, you have to acknowledge them for something that they have done that has touched you, that it's important to you. It's not enough to say, oh, I love your work. Well, they hear that all the time. But if you say, well, that moment in that film when so-and-so did such and such changed my life. I mean, that's just an example. It has to be very specific and it, because no one can resist that. So that's not phony. You have to mean it, too, of course. You, you understand what I'm saying? It, it's, you have to acknowledge them so that they understand you get them and you develop a relationship. Because you may develop lots of relationships that will not lead to work. I mean, most yeah. of them will not. Only some of them will. But 
people that you have a relationship know other people. You don't do this. You don't build a career by yourself. You do it with relationships, and it's really important to understand that. Yes. I couldn't stress it enough. I appreciate that you brought up uh, the authenticity of what you're saying to the person, of pointing out something specific. And I, I think a good sort of a good example of that is myself with you, in that you were in one of my favorite movies, Gettysburg, and I was able to reach out to you because of that and just because of a, a very genuine enthusiasm that I have about that movie, about that time period, about the history of that and your performance and how I've specifically loved that. And, and that was able well, and, to connect us. And here we are. We have this interview as a result of that. Yeah. I mean, that's a perfect example of what we we're just talking about. You know, you need to develop a whole team of people who are on your side and who could advise or simply help you. But it's because you have a relationship and they want to help you. Yeah. You know, your talent is important, but it's not enough. Your passion and enthusiasm is everything. I mean, it's hard to understand that. But you have to be able to share yourself and, and acknowledgement is the key. And I've heard many, many very powerful, powerful people in the business say just that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, don't want to, I, I don't mind dropping names, but I've heard over and over. I've heard that over and over. So I know that that's true. I just didn't always do it uh, in my own career in terms of, for instance, auditioning and interviews. I very, it was very much about the work. I went in, I concentrate on the character. I come in, I introduce myself, and I do the audition, and then I leave. Yeah. I never didn't really talk to them about anything or acknowledge them. Oftentimes, I didn't even know. I didn't know anything about the people. Well, that's career death. <laughs> even if you're a brilliant actor, you have to be lucky to get it. But relationships, they have to want, the people who hire you, they don't really hire actors anyway. They hire confidence. Mm -hmm. And they want to hire someone that they like and that they could imagine working with who can maybe get, of course, get the job done. But it's not enough to be able to do the job. You, they have to want to work with you. That's good. <laughs> That's real good. Because I, I think the assumption for uh, aspiring actors is that, hey, they just want to see my skills. They don't care well, about I've, me as I've a person. I've seen it over and over where uh, less skilled people have prevailed uh -huh. for jobs in production and acting and everything than the more more skilled because they didn't want to work with the, the, the other person who was a pain in the, excuse me, sure. you know? So uh, anyway, ever onward. <laughs> <laughs> Well, since I brought up Gettysburg uh, being one of my favorite movies, can you share with us a little bit about how you were put in touch with Ron Maxwell, the casting crew, and how this all came about? Uh, sure, I'd be glad to. Uh, I was going through a very tough time in my career when I heard about Killer Angels. And I was really at the bottom of, really, it was a terrible time. And my wife at the time said, you know, you're, you're just, you're, you're depressed, you're not taking care of business. And I picked up the trades, and there was a picture of Robert Duvall, who was going to be doing a film called Killer Angels. Okay. And he was going to play Robert E. Lee. And I said to myself, oh, there's got to be something for that in me. So happened, I was working as a delivery person for the studio at that time as a money job, because I was... That was really the bottom of the barrel because I'd work, been working for many years as an actor. And early on, I had to do extra jobs, but this was the job I was really down. So I delivered my own picture to the production office as a messenger. <laughs> and then about a week later, my agent called and said, uh, you know, we've got an audition for you for uh, the Killer Angels. Mm -hmm. And I thought, yeah, you did. Uh, <laughs> I didn't say that to them. I said, fine. So I went in. And I auditioned. I wanted to, to read for another part. But when I walked in, they said, no, we'd like you to read for General Hood. And luckily, I had a good reading. And they later told me that when they saw my picture, they said they just prayed that I could act because I had that. I had something of a look. I didn't really look like Hood, but there was something there. Yeah. And um, that's a compliment in itself. Yeah, that was that was great. Uh, the film itself was an unusual experience in that everyone was really focused on the project and there was no ego. I'm not saying there was not any ego, but there was no 
a negative uh, kind of star behavior or privilege behavior among any of the actors. Ain't nothing like that. Everybody was for getting, getting it right, getting it good. Yeah. And I think it showed in the in the film. It's, any any historical inaccuracies are very small, if any at all, and that's unusual in a historical film, as you know. Yes, that that's one of the reasons I love it so much. Is you know people don't realize the how accurate it it really is, and that you're actually shooting at Gettysburg. We you know the scene that you your favorite scene there, the confrontation mm-hmm. with uh, Longstreet. We shot inside of the Round Tops. I mean, they're in the background. Yeah. And, uh, not as they were then, of course, but yeah. we we actually filmed right there, and so that was uh, that was something else. I mean, that added to all, all the feeling about doing that scene, and of course, all the reenactors that were involved in those scenes. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it was really great. So the uh, the clip that you're referring to is a confrontation between you as as General Hood and Tom Berenger, who's playing yeah. General Longstreet, and. It's one of my favorite scenes. I've watched, I, I will literally put in the movie in the past just to watch that one scene. Uh, <laughs> and because me being an aspiring filmmaker, that, you know, there's certain scenes that you just go, that's why I want to make movies. And that, for yes. me, that's one of those. I'm going to have a, a link to that clip in the show notes, but I uh, was wondering if you could break down a little bit about the, you know, the day that you're shooting at, what you're thinking as you're going into that. There, there's a uh, lot of pieces in this. When you ride away, the cannons are firing. Uh, sure. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on. Well, a lot of that, you know, was, of course, it was all staged in advance. I mean, figuring out the action, which it, uh, Ron had, had done, and the cinematographer, of course, uh, and getting everybody set up. It was, it was, you know, it was a complicated setup. Uh, I sat around on horseback with my, my staff, who I'd, I'd asked to get with me, who were actually all but one of them were, were actual Texans. Okay. Mm-hmm. And they were the the uh, wranglers for the film, so mm-hmm. they were excellent horsemen. So we, we you know, we, that's the idea is to look good. I, <laughs> I wanna, one of the first things I did when I, you know, when I met when I came on the the production was to meet with the wranglers, you know, have a good relationship with them because. As I, I said, I, I, I do know how to ride, but r- the movie wranglers know. Every actor says, oh, yes, I can ride. And the next thing he does, he falls off the horse. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, you know, I, I really do know how to ride. I grew up playing cowboys and Indians on horses. I said, but but I'm not an expert, and Hood was. So yeah. you give me a good horse. One's not going to give me a bad time. One that's going to make me look good. And then I, you know, beforehand, I was there before I started filming. So I went out and practiced riding and everything a lot so uh but we were waiting to do that scene and and i knew it was important and i wanted to get the idea of going around to the right i've talked to some military uh historians and things saying that it actually probably was was not practical that it wouldn't have worked just for the reasons they wouldn't have been able to put any artillery up there or anything there are lots of reasons but of course, every reenactment where they have a technical, uh, where they have a tactical, <laughs> and Hood goes to the right, they always win. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> but uh, no, I wasn't thinking of any of that. I was just thinking about Hood. I was a little bit concerned about the new. I had a uniform, as you notice in the film. It's it's, it's a pretty new uniform, yeah. and the only two pictures I've seen of Hood. One of them is a really rumpled one when he was a. Uh, a little bit younger, and then the other one is an older. It was after Gettysburg. Okay. And I was concerned, but then I, I had made up my mind that he'd just come from Atlanta. He'd been with Jefferson Davis, and he'd been with the love of his life, and just asked her to marry him. And I said, he had a new uniform made for all these balls. <laughs> and then he had to leave, so of course he's going to wear the uniform. He's the last person he sees is her. Is it? That's that's the kind of stuff going in my mind, thinking about what he was thinking about. Uh, his his position, you know, he was an officer that got in the middle of things. Yeah. And uh, this was not a good situation. You know, those lines are prophetic. It's the worst ground I ever saw. I mean, I think it probably was the worst ground he ever saw. They don't need bullets. They can roll rocks down on us. Oh, yeah. I mean, 
all that, that, that stuff. Was true. I don't know that he actually said those things, but he certainly must have thought them. Yeah, exactly. You know, one thing that really stood out to me too, this is sort of small, but uh, the idea that you were on a white horse, it really separated yourself from everybody else riding with you. Yeah, yeah. And, and he probably wouldn't have been on a white horse, but it's the movies. That's, that's <laughs> the kind of thing, okay, well, we'll let that go. Yeah. But yeah, it does help him stand out. You see him in that scene. Did you do a lot of research on Hood before you started the part? Well, oh, yes. I mean, I read everything that I could find about him. Uh, I really did. I had, And I had more time than a lot of actors. I was cast fairly early, so okay. I had a few months. Not like poor Martin Sheen, who had a few <laughs> weeks at the most. But, yeah, I read everything that I could and every reference to him. The interesting thing was, I mentioned going out and writing, practicing writing. I would, I would go out and visit the reenactors and be in character. And uh, I learned a lot from the reenactors that I didn't get in the history books at all. And and I, it's a lot of it is anecdotal. It may, some of it may have not been true, but it was sitting around the campfire with the reenactors who were very much, as you know, were very much into playing their roles on and off camera yeah uh, and i went along with that too because it helped me get into it so by the time i'd sat around a few campfires and smoked some cigars and had a few drinks and something to eat and and shared stories uh i ha had a really good feeling about hood hmm. that complemented the research that i had done i have this uh big respect for civil war reenactors because they they appreciate their history so much it's just amazing that you're able to take that many guys and throw them in this film and they know exactly what they should do. Yeah. Well, you know, without the reenactors, those films could not be done. I yeah. just, this cost, that's why even still with something like trying to be developed now to Appomattox, wonderful scripts and, and stories and just incredible stuff, but it's hard of course, they'll have to use reenactors. That's the only reason uh, Killer Angels was finally made, was that they you know, did not have to pay the reenactors what they would have had to pay movie extras. I mean, there was the th thought of going to Yugoslavia and using the Yugoslavian army and all that kind of stuff. You know, this all, it's all, wow. movie making is, it's all about money. Yeah. I mean, the bottom line, it's got to, it's got to make money and it costs money. So how are you going to do that? So period films, especially if you have horses and, and period weapons and costumes, oh, it's very, very expensive. Well, to shift just a little bit here, I wanted to ask you, if you had it to do again, what would you do differently in your career? Well, I put off focusing totally on acting, although I studied acting, and I, and I very seriously, but I didn't feel like I knew enough and that I needed to study more. So I, I was always, as a dancer, even from the age of four, almost every year we went, my mother and I went to Hollywood and we studied with the great dancers. And uh, I did plays and, and, and in school and I knew I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be Errol Flynn. I wanted to be Tarzan. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to be Gene Kelly, Fred Astaire. And I knew that I would do that. But I kept pushing because I was married young and I had a, a dance school when I was still in high school. Wow. And I performed in college musicals and stuff like that. Still all the time knowing that I'm, I'm going to go to Hollywood to be in films. Yeah. But to make a, a long story very short, eventually I was drafted. I joined the Navy actually when I was 17 in high school during the Korean, uh, during the Korean War. Mm -hmm. But ended up in the reserves. And then... After I had been married and we had a child and then there was a divorce, I got drafted. And I said, you can't draft me. I'm in the Navy. He says, well, you haven't done your active duty yet. So I chose to go in the Army. And that's how I ended up in Europe. And that was my break in my career because the last job I had in, in Vegas, I had been offered a singing, dancing, acting role in a Broadway musical. And then I got drafted. So I said... This is a sign. I'm, I'm finished with dancing now. I'm going to concentrate on the acting. And uh, I was able to do that. In the military, I couldn't because I had a special rating. I was in communications and 